September 17, 1995. 12 miles east of Johannesburg, South Africa, a police reservist is taking the day off to hunt rabbits in one of the vast fields called Velds. Suddenly, the stench of decomposing flesh fills the air. Women's bodies at varying degrees of decomposition lay before him. Ten in all. Some of them were quite fresh, and some of them were dehydrated, and some of them were skeletons. Police arrive quickly and fan out over the area. They believe this killing field is the work of the serial killer they had been tracking for more than a year. At first, they had found victims one by one, but this discovery demonstrates that the killer has become more adept and more daring. The bodies of 30 women have now been found in similar fields from Johannesburg to Pretoria. The victims were all black and between the ages of 19 and 43. All had been strangled with articles of clothing, panties, bras, stockings. Leon Nell was one of the lead investigators on the case. He used sticks to actually wind the stocking and or um, clothing around the necks. The first body connected to the killer was found on July 16, 1994, outside of Johannesburg. Soon after, two more victims turned up. Superintendent Vinyl Phil Yoon began to see a pattern. The scenes were similar to each other. We started looking into the fact that it can be a serial killer. One young mother had her hands bound with her own brassiere. A few feet away was the body of her infant son. As the year wore on, police would discover a body every two weeks, then once a week, then two every week. Yes, I'm very afraid. I can't even walk in the, in the, in, in the night. Now, less than a year after the end of apartheid, black women were subject to a new form of tyranny. I think uh, he's, he's making all the women scared. And then I, I don't feel very good about it. And when we go around in town or whatever, because we don't know where he stays. So I was very scared and don't know what to do. Black will to find that man. Yeah, they must, they must fight to, they must fight to, to, to get him. The police can't cope with this type of criminal activity without the wholehearted support of the community. And we would like to appeal to the community once again to come forward with any, any portion of possible information. So brutal were the crimes, President Nelson Mandela made a personal visit to the desolate killing field. Investigators had found DNA evidence and many leads but no clear suspects. We didn't know who we were looking for. It was, um, it could be anybody. It's a race against time to catch him before he kills another innocent person. Then, while sifting through evidence, police investigator Leon Nell remembered a recent news story about a missing woman. There was an article in the Star newspaper about a, a lady, Trafina Mokhotsi. She disappeared under very suspicious circumstances. Nell wondered if Trifina could be another victim of the serial killer. He decided to question her co-workers. One of them remembered a man who had come to their workplace and offered Trifina a job just days before she disappeared. This matched stories told by the family members of other victims. But this time, Trifina's friend, Esther Malangu, remembered a name. He told us that uh, his Moses is told told us his name. Nell ran a check with the name Moses Sitole and uncovered one man who had been convicted of rape. Police showed Sitole's picture to Trafina's co-workers and they positively identified him. Detectives went to Sitole's home but found that he had left his common-law wife, Martha, and his daughter, Brahit, a few weeks before. Sitole seemed to be one step ahead of them. Investigators put Sitole's picture on the front page of newspapers all over the country. Every day that he's uh, out uh, and walking around the streets of South Africa, it can be another 
female that fall victim to him. And it became an obsession to me to apprehend him as quick as possible to stop him from killing another innocent person. October 1995, South African police were on the trail of suspected serial killer Moses Sitole. They knew his name, but they had no idea where he was. Then on October 18th, after receiving a tip from Sitole's brother-in-law, detectives were finally able to arrest Sitole. The man suspected of murdering 37 women and one child was finally in custody. Esther Malangu, a friend of one of the victims, was relieved to hear the news. The woman I'm working with, we screaming, saying that that's it. They catch him at last. We're going to be safe now. While Sitole awaited trial, a fellow inmate managed to secretly videotape an interview with him. Zitole felt that he had been betrayed by women his whole life and that his hatred was justified. When we try to understand a serial killer, or any criminal for that matter, things have to be looked at. How and where this person grew up. Moses was the fourth child of Sophie and Simon Tangawira Sitole. He was born on November 17, 1964, in the South African township of Fosloras. It was a time when the apartheid government controlled blacks by segregating them in isolated areas. Any dissent was met with extreme force. Many black leaders were jailed. As a youth, Moses Sitole saw resistance to this oppression turn violent. The moment you wake up in the morning to the moment you, you know, lay down to sleep, it's this struggle against this government, this oppressive power, and it affects everything that you do in your life. Black workers were forced to live in company housing near the factories and mines where they were employed. Moses was a bright and curious boy, but he had few opportunities for education. Life within his tin-roofed home was difficult. He'd been abused by his mother, who he says was an alcoholic, from a stepsister that he says abused him from being raped by a woman uh, in his younger years. Then, when he was six years old, Moses' father died. Because Simon Satole was the sole provider, Sophie and her six children were evicted from their home. Moses spent the remainder of his childhood bouncing from one poorly run youth home to another. Sitole described these conditions more than 20 years later during his prison interview. The treatment was bad, really bad. You had to be strong to survive. Miserable, Moses escaped when he was about eight years old and tried to return to his mother. He made his way home crossing vast veldts and passing through shanty towns. But there was no joyous reunion. Instead, his mother sent the boy back to the orphanage. Hurt has been my daily bread. Hurt has been my prayer. Every minute, every second, every day, every week, every month, and every year. Because of a feeling of powerlessness, starts to fantasize about a way to obtain power. When he was about 11, Moses was moved to yet another orphanage in KwaZulu Natal, an apartheid designated black homeland near the Indian Ocean. In his early teens, Moses ran away again. He hitchhiked 300 miles back to Fosloris to stay with his older brother, Patrick. Now on his own, Moses worked menial jobs. He 
He trained as an amateur boxer, building his strength. He also became popular with local women for his charm and disarming smile. Sitole's defense attorney, Eben Jordan. What I can tell you, he is a very intelligent man. Uh, well spoken. He was apparently he was a member of the library in Pretoria. He took out classic, classical music CDs. But his friendly demeanor hit a warped view of women. He was quick to anger. The slightest rejection from a member of the opposite sex could trigger a violent rage. The first time Sitole acted on these impulses came in 1987, when he attacked his girlfriend's sister, 38-year-old Patricia Kumalo. He lured her uh, to the mine dump in Cleveland, in Johannesburg, where he raped her. He left Kamalo tied up with her clothing thrown up over her face. She managed to escape, but fearing for her life, she never went to the authorities. Sitole had not yet killed, but like other serial killers, this first crime established a pattern one that would become more violent and complex over the next eight years. Serial killers all have a fantasy, which, which is the basic blueprint of what they do. The problem is reality is never as perfect as fantasy. So they keep on repeating it in order to get it right, to get it perfect. And, and the problem is it will never be as perfect as it is in your fantasy. A desolate veld outside of Johannesburg would soon become the stage for Moses Sitole's twisted fantasies of power and death. Johannesburg, South Africa, 1987. 22-year-old Moses Sitole had raped his first victim. Because she was too afraid to tell the police, Sitole was able to assault another woman. His actions became more violent over time. His third victim, Lindiwi Nikosi, was another girlfriend's sister. He lured her to a remote spot, then threatened to pour gasoline on her and set her on fire if she didn't submit. After raping Nikosi, he choked her until she lost consciousness. When she revived, he told her he would kill her if she went to the authorities. She, too, kept silent. Emboldened, Sitoli committed more rapes. There's an incredible tension building up in him. It's almost like an urge. He must get to this point where he is going to, 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 to stalk, to find uh, a person, the, the right person. And also all the tension and planning that goes behind getting the right person and then actually uh, acting out the plan that he has been fantasizing. Investigator Leon Nell would see that Sitole's victims fit a profile. I was told you'd go for um, ladies that uh, were looking for work. They were easy targets. Sitole met Doris Swakamisa in Germiston in February 1989. At the time, Sitole worked as a store clerk, but he told Doris that he was a successful businessman from a neighboring town. Sitole promised Doris employment and offered to personally escort her to her new job. When they arrived at the train station, Sitole told Swakamisa that they could take a shortcut through the Veld. Once they had walked far enough so no one would hear her screams, Sitole pulled out a knife hidden in a folded newspaper and told Doris he was going to rape her. Sitole tied Swakamisa's hands with her underwear then assaulted her. He claimed he would not kill her if she promised not to tell anyone. He then left her in the veld with her hands and feet bound. Three months later, Doris Swakamisa spotted Moses Adole in a shop in